We are waiting, waiting for news of the fulfillment of God's promise. We are waiting for the birth of the Prince of Peace. Welcome to this time of worship as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. As we're able, let us stand together for the call to worship. Have you not heard? Something new has happened. Yes, yes we have heard. Rumors say a child has been born, a Savior given. People of God, these are not rumors. Born this day in Bethlehem is Christ our Savior. This is good news of great joy for all people. Let us go see the Savior of God and bring him gifts of grace. Let us go to Bethlehem and worship him. Come, all ye faithful, come and hear again the news of Jesus' birth. Bask in the glory of the angel's announcement. Kneel with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds at the manger. Come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Our hymn is number 41. O oh, come, all ye faithful. Triune God, whom we praise this night. 
All glory to you, eternal God, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us. Amen and amen. Let us join our voices in the song, Candle of Hope. The words are printed in the back of your bulletin. Thank you. 
like ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you to the Lord. Our hymn is number 22, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Please remain seated. We're singing verses 1, 2, and 4. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ you came among us, a light shining in the darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. Forgive our doubt, renew our hope, so we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ the Lord. Almighty God, hear us now as we each offer our own silent prayers of confession. In Jesus' name, Amen. The good news of Christmas is the forgiveness of sin and new life through the babe of Bethlehem. Let us commit our lives to Christ's way of hope and peace and love. Thanks be to Emmanuel, God with us, who came to set us free, to love and to serve. Alleluia. Amen. 
Let us stand together for the glory of God. It's red and white, and what's the shape? Cane. Cane. Or if you turn it a different way, what's it look like? Yeah. And what would the J stand for? Yeah. Jesus, that's right. We've talked a lot about over the course of Advent the different symbols that we work into our Christmas season. The candy cane is another one. That some can look at it and just say it's a piece of candy. Well, candy's good. We like sweet things sometimes, don't we? Candy cane and a little hot chocolate is pretty tasty. But this is another way to remember what Jesus' birth means to us. We can look at it one way, like this, and it's a J and reminds us of Jesus and Jesus' birth, which we celebrate. If you turn it this way, you called it a staff or a cane. Do you remember in the story you might have had a staff or a shepherd? Right. So we turn it this way and think about the shepherds who got to go meet Jesus that very night that he was born. And then also we have the white, which depending on which story you hear, some say it's white for Virgin Mary. Some say it's white for Jesus because he was sin free. He never sinned. But then the red reminds us that Jesus gave his life for us. So the candy cane kind of gives us a brief synopsis of Jesus' whole lifetime. It also reminds us that Jesus is sometimes called the Good Shepherd. So when we think about it as a staff or a king, we can think of Jesus as, as a good shepherd. So you're welcome to take those home with you. You can be sure and ask mom and dad before you get into those. Make sure you ask for permission. So let's say a prayer before you go back to your seat. Loving God, we thank you for the many ways that you help us remember you through the symbols and signs of the season. Simple candy canes are a lesson in the gospel. Lights on the Christmas tree remind us that you are the light of the world. But in all of it, we give thanks for the birth of Jesus Christ who came to offer each one of us salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas to you guys. Let us join our voices together in our unison prayer for illumination, which is printed in your bulletin. Triune God, as we hear again of your gracious love shown through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, may we receive your gift with joy. Through the hearing of your word, may we see your glory and love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Please stay seated. Our hymn is number two. Come thou long expected Jesus.
2, verses 8 through 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen them, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard which were just as they had been told. Our hymn is number 59, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night, verses 1 through 4. On a snowy Christmas Eve, in a small English village, a young man made his way along a dark, deserted cobblestone street. His name was Thomas. He was wrapped in a woolen cloak, a knapsack flung across his back. In his hand, he carried a tin candle lantern. Behind the lantern's glass pane sat the remains of a spent candle. When he saw the glow of candlelight through the shop window of the candler, the village candlemaker, he hurried his steps, turning onto the snow-covered pathway. But in Thomas's way stood a beggar, shaking his cup for coin. Thomas pushed him aside impatiently and opened the door to the shop. Inside the shop, metal pots filled with tallow and beeswax hung from a stone heart. The old candler stood with his sculptor's tools in his hands, surrounded by these beautiful creations he had made out of wax. I'm lucky to find you here, Thomas said. The town is empty. The old man gazed silently at Thomas as Thomas glanced around the rows of the sculpted candles. There were sprites and fairies, 
and angels with see-through wings, and fragile princesses in gowns as delicate as lace. They smelled of myrrh and frankincense and metal flowers. You're a foolish old man, Thomas said. You spend hours making beautiful things that devour themselves. How long before the flame melts an angel into an ugly clump of wax? He pointed to a row of simpler candles. I only need light. I'll take one of those. The candler looked steadily at Thomas. The Christmas candles of her are of no good to you. Thomas was startled by this stern response, but he snickered. It would do me much good not to stumble in the dark. Are you playing with the old man? I will not pay you more than what the candle is worth. It's only four coppers, said the shopman, but you might find it costly. The old man's words were strangely serious. I have money. Give me the candle, Thomas shouted. It's late. My family is waiting for me. I need illumination to find my way home. Then it is illumination you desire, the candle said softly. That is what I need, Thomas said. The candle maker nodded slowly. So you do. He took a candle, he dipped it over the flame, and then placed it inside the lantern's tin frame. Thomas dropped some coins on the counter and walked to the door. The old man's lips pursed in an odd but amused smile when he said, Merry Christmas, my brother. The farewell surprised Thomas, to you as well. And then he hastily stepped out into the darkness, the lantern lighting his path ahead. Thomas had traveled only a short distance when a shadow emerged from an alleyway. A robber, he thought fearfully. He held out his lantern. Who is there? And then in the frail, in the darkness and in the light of the candle, he saw it was a frail old woman huddled against the cold. Sir, she cried, a pence, a pence, please. Thomas's eyes narrowed in contempt at the beggar woman. And then as he looked at her more closely, he caught his breath. He knew her face well. It was his own mother. Mother, what is this prank? Why do you greet me as a beggar? The woman stared at him. Just a half pence, sir. Why are you here? Where are my brothers, my sister? Thomas asked. He reached out to her, but she pulled away. Mother, how peculiar you act. You'll catch a chill. Here, take my cloak. He removed it and held it out to her. Cautiously, she came forward. And then she snatched the coat and retreated into the shadows. But as she moved away from the lantern's light, her appearance changed. She was not his mother, but a beggar indeed, with Thomas's cloak in hand, and she disappeared into the darkness. A strange trick, he said to himself. He wrapped his arms around his chest, wishing he'd held on to his cloak. It is I who will catch a chill now. Thomas walked on, quickening his pace against the frigid air. As he passed beneath the awning of a darkened inn, the candle revealed a form lying in the gutter. He held out the lantern again and gasped, Has the universe gone mad? Alan, my brother, are you sick? He set the lantern down. He pulled his brother's limp arm around his shoulder, struggled to lift him. Alan, I can't carry you. He pounded on the inn's door, which was opened by a grim-faced woman. Thomas said, my brother is sick, and I fear he'll freeze before I can come back for you. May I bring him inside? For the price of a knife, she cackled, a shilling. A shilling? Thomas reached into his pocket. I have only a sixpence. The old woman scowled and began to shut the door. Wait, wait, my knapsack is worth more than a shilling. And the trousers inside are newly tailored. I will give you everything. The old woman looked at the bundle and then reached out her fat hand. Thomas flung his knapsack from his back and handed it to her with the last of his money. She opened the door. Bring him in. <clears throat> Leaving the lantern on the curb, Thomas dragged the man into the inn's foyer. As he gently laid him on the wooden floor, he saw that the man's face, like the beggar's, 
was suddenly changed. The old woman said, so it's your brother who lay in the gutter. Thomas looked at the man. He, he, he is not my brother. You are mad, the woman said, and she shoved him out the door. Outside, he picked up his lantern and looked into the glass panes, muttering, there is something strange about your life. And he continued on toward home. Thomas had just glimpsed the bright lights of his neighborhood when he came across a little girl shivering in the cold. Have you anything to eat, sir, she asked. Thomas felt a stirring in his chest. This child was tiny, no bigger than his sister. Suddenly pulled the lantern away. He wouldn't shine it in her face. He could guess the trick it would play. And what could he do for this poor child? He had no, but he had no food, he had no money, he had nothing left to give. I have nothing, Thomas heard as he left her, willing himself not to turn and look at her. Penniless and cold, Thomas trudged onward, hardly glancing at the familiar houses of his childhood neighborhood. His own home was dressed for the season. Music and laughter came from inside. As he entered the foyer, his mother greeted him with great excitement. Thomas, you've arrived. And hearing her cry, his sister and brothers rushed into the room to welcome him as well. When all the laughter had begun to settle, his mother looked at him rather strangely and said, Thomas, where is your cloak? Yes, said his brother Alan, where, why can you not have a pack? Thomas gazed solemnly into their bewildered faces. I gave everything away. To whom? his mother asked. Thomas looked down at the waning Christmas candle in the lantern. The old man spoke the truth. You are indeed costly. A smile of understanding slowly spread across his face. And a great word. What is this riddle? What old man? his sister asked. A wise man who sculpts candles, Thomas replied, as he gazed at the face of his sister. And just then, in his mind, her bright face became the face of that woeful, hungry child out in the cold. Thomas looked around. He looked at the sumptuous banquet laid out on the table. He turned quickly to the door. Thomas, where are you going? His sister asked. I must go see about another member of our family, he said. And as Thomas left the warm, fragrant house with a cold night, his heart was warm with joy. For that Christmas Eve, he learned a lesson and he took it to heart. If we will see things as they truly are, we will find that all, from great to small, belong to one family. And this truth, known from the beginning of time, is perhaps best seen in the joyous illumination of Christmas. Thomas's Christmas candle did more than illuminate his path home. It opened his heart to compassion for others by revealing that all he met should be to him as his own family. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, it is written, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. John is referring to Jesus Christ. And after more than 2,000 years of darkness, Christ's light still shines in the hearts of those who believe and trust in him. And during the Advent and Christmas seasons, we celebrate with candles and wreaths and trees filled with lights, a reminder that into this dark world, a light has come through Jesus Christ. Christ is the candle in the darkness, a light by which we can see all things differently. Christ was born not in a palace to kings and queens, but in a humble stable, visited by working class shepherds, who suddenly had important and good news to share with the world. And in time, the family was visited by wise men from the East, who had studied the stars and followed the light to find the child. To this babe of Bethlehem, we are challenged to look at the world as Jesus Christ did, to see in each face one who is beloved by God, one who is a part of the human family. 
Jesus Christ is the light of the world. It is Jesus who illuminates and holds all things together. Even broken, hardened hearts respond to the hope that can be found at the manger. Let us take the light of Christ into the world, sharing the glad tidings that through Jesus Christ we can see the world in a new way, that through Christ we can see love, hope, peace, and joy, and that they are revealed not just at Christmas time, but every day of the year. Alleluia. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together and sing number 31, Heart the Herald Angels Sing. Verses 1 and 3. Thank you. 